The following is Class 7 on the Yoga Sutras, given by Ridayananda Das Goswami in fall of 2004 in San Luis Obispo. Sutras 220 to 227 will be covered in this class. Last time we did um, the two there, the, these verses are numbered two means it's the second of four parts of the Yoga Sutras and then the the number after the period is the verse number. So this is part two, verse 17. We did that. I'll just very briefly review it, very quickly, where Patanjali said that, hey, you hey, to, the reason you should give up something, the reason you should reject or renounce or give up something is because it creates or it constitutes a confusion, a false putting together or bringing together two things that are really different in your mind. And the two things that are different are the seer, in other words, you as a conscious being who are observing the world, and uh, the seen, that which is simply an object of seeing. In other words, in the most practical instance of what he's really getting at, uh, we are, according to this ancient understanding, we are eternal souls within bodies. We are not bodies that have souls. I mean, the soul is not like this little luminous battery you have inside you. Like, I'm basically, this is me, what you see, and I've got this little spiritual battery inside of me, which is my soul. It's the, it's the opposite. We really are souls. We are spiritual people, but we are in bodies, which is the same understanding for me. You actually find the letters of Paul of Tarsus, and you I mean, find it all over spiritual literature that we are spiritual beings and we have bodies. So when I look at you or when you look at me, the drishya, that which you can observe, is the external form, the body. But inside my body, inside your body, is us. That's what we are. We are the conscious beings who are moving these bodies. In that sense, the body is like a virtual reality machine. You know, we get in this body and we walk around like, hey, I'm a man or I'm a woman or I'm whatever a tarantula. It just depends on what kind of body you have. Potentially says, if a particular state of mind, an emotion, like, for example, lust or greed or anger, makes you identify the soul, eternal soul, the temporary body, that's a sun yoga, bringing these things together. He said, that's a good reason to give something up. If, if it creates ignorance. If it, if it, because that's the bondage. Because if I, if I think that I am this body, as opposed to God has given me this body, then it follows logically that I'm part of the material world. I belong here. This is home sweet home, the universe. And if I identify with and bind myself to this temporary abode, I'm losing the chance to go to the eternal realm, which is where the soul is meant, meant to live. So from the spiritual point of view, it's a disaster to identify with the body. He gives like, sort of a t typical ancient technical classification of different kinds of physical things which we won't dwell on again. And then Patanjali says that drashta drishi matra shudho bi pratyayanu pasyaha. Very powerful and pithy statement as sutras usually are. He says that the drashta, the seer, the seer is drishi matra, which means something like it is simply, it is only the, the power of seeing itself. And even though the seer, in other words, the soul, the real person, is pure, shudho api, pratyanupasha, if you have faith and if you have conviction and a proper understanding, the soul also can be seen, spiritually. And, and what I, I, I explained something last time, I'll go over it very quickly again, because it's a, it's something which Patanjali is doing, somewhat technical, but it's, it's very meaningful in Sanskrit. And that is the Sanskrit, the Sanskrit language, as I've explained, is analyzed always by ancient grammarians as originally having roots, dhatus are called the roots, and they're verbal roots. So sort of like the paradigmatic expression is an action. Action is seen as kind of like the most basic state of things is, is some type of action. And so you have these verbal roots and then the, the roots grow into stems and into words, all kinds of words. 
So in this case, the root drish is the root which means to see. It's not really infinitive, it's not to see, it's not the infinitive, which is drushtim, but it's, it's the root of seeing, of the verb to see. And so uh, this verb is irregular in the sense that in many cases, like the seer, drushter, comes out of this, or seeing darshana, you probably heard that word darshana, which comes from this root, which means literally like an audience of an important person or seeing the person, and so on. However, when the verb is actually conjugated, like I see, you see, we all see, and et cetera, et cetera, when the verb is conjugated, it takes a very different form. For example, to say you see would be pasya see. The see is the part that makes it you, the second person singular. So this pasya is actually a, a very irregular stem, which must be from some other ancient form. This is a very irregular stem of the, of the root drish, which is to see. Now the way Patanjali uses this fact in this verse, he actually takes advantage of this fact in the following way. All along, he's been talking about, there goes the swaman. Uh, all along, Patanjali, in this whole discussion, is making the distinction between drashtar, the seer, and by the way, this R, to, uh, which makes it the agent, the seer, is related to our English R. To make, you take a verb to make it the person that does something, you add an R, like the seer, the doer, the buyer, the seller. Same thing in Sanskrit. So the ter, this ter makes it the person who. So drush to see, drush ter, the seer. So he's making this distinction between the seer and drishya, this, that which is to be seen, which means the object of seeing. So that which is drishya, that which is to be seen or can be seen is the body or the physical world. And then you have the seer, which is the soul. And he keeps making this distinction. In fact, if you confuse these two, that's the whole problem that yoga is supposed to eradicate, this confusion. But now he wants to make the point that spiritually the soul can be seen. It's actually possible if you purify yourself and, and, and come into higher consciousness, especially as potentially stresses by devotion to God. As I pointed out many times, samadhi sid here, uh, ishvara pringana, that the perfection of samadhi, the highest stage of yoga, comes by devotion to God, something not always taught. When he wants to say the soul also can be seen, he uses this form, pascha, because he doesn't want you to confuse it with this jargon he's always using to mean a physical thing. Therefore, he says the soul also is anu pascha, which means it, the anu here. Yeah, following. And so Anu means following. So in other words, if you follow the right path in turn, so to speak, the soul also can be seen, but he uses a different form of the verbs. You know, he's, he's not saying the soul is a physical object. So what yes. century is uh, potential? Oh, probably about a few thousand years ago. But he's, everyone agrees that what happened is in... In ancient times, and you find this even in other cultures besides Indian culture, that you have these very long traditions coming down. I'll give you the example of, of Homer. Most scholars agree that Homer, who wrote the Elegy Odyssey, didn't invent that type of narrative. He just culminated it. That you had this long oral tradition coming down, telling these kinds of stories, like you know, the Elegy the Odyssey. And Homer did it so well that everyone figured, hey, this is definitive. We don't need any other version of it. So it kind of froze at that point. So they see Homer as culminating in the same way in all the different Indian schools like the Yoga school or Sankhya or, and all these things when, or, or Panini and grammar when someone really did something in a super way people just said well that's good enough and they kind of forget, forgot what came earlier as with Homer. So the dirty little secret of Indian studies scholarship is that the dates are very very uncertain. The dates are very uncertain and uh I won't go into all the reasons why, technically, the, the, history, the, the lack of historiographical tendencies in ancient India. But anyway, the fact is that uh, dates are very uncertain. But as far as you can date this, they say about approximately 2,000 years old. But clearly, he potentially didn't invent yoga. He's just, he's very consciously just presenting something that's ancient for him. So it's very old. 
Anyway, I wanted to point that out because the soul also is a, is a real thing. It's, 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 it's a real existing thing. You can see it's tangible. It's just not material. You need spiritual senses. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says to Arjun that Dadami Divyam Chakshuste, I give you divine eyes so that you can see the, the form of the Lord. So, so you have this notion of, of spiritual senses, of divine, that as persons, we are conscious, we see, we hear, we touch, we taste and smell and so on and so on. The point is that the power of seeing, the power of hearing, the power of tasting, touching, smelling, feeling, relation, all these things come from the soul. But it comes through the material body and becomes materialized, you could say. It's like you have rose-colored glasses on. The world looks rose-colored. So the original power of seeing and hearing belongs to the soul. Just as God sees and hears, the soul also sees and hears. But because the soul is in a body, we now see and hear materially. It's filtered, so it's, it's, it's almost like filters out the spiritual sights and sounds, the body. That's why in yoga we learn to go inward. Because if consciousness can focus inward, you can experience consciousness not filtered through a material body. It's like, t- take a red light or a green light, a you know, traffic light. If you take off the red or green glass, we're going to find behind the glass just regular white light, a clear light. So in the same way, when you take off the filter of this body and let consciousness just be conscious without being filtered, it's spiritual consciousness. And, and, and that's why attachment to the body, I, I mean, we don't, we don't hate the body, we don't self-flagellate, in yoga, I mean, we don't whip ourselves or there's no chains and we don't despise the body. The body is, is honored as a wonderful gift of God. The body is a wonderful gift to be, to be cherished and, and taken care of because it, because it can be used for the greatest purposes. However, that's not attachment. I mean, to, to, to have a vehicle or an instrument and to value it and honor it and take care of it doesn't mean you're attached to it. It just means you appreciate its use. And so if we become attached to the body, what that means is my consciousness necessarily will be filtered through the body, which means that filters out spiritual reality. And so that's why it's so important in yoga to achieve unfiltered consciousness, which means you can't be attached to your body. Although you appreciate it and, you know, take care of it. Yes, you. Is intuition related to the soul? Intuition? Uh, or is it well, consciousness? Well, intuition is, is a type of consciousness, really. It's one of the faculties, you might say. Mm-hmm. And so we have spiritual intuition, which can be revoked. Hmm? I was thinking maybe inspiration. All those spirit, things. Form. Yeah. yeah, yeah, all those things are applicable. In other words, the full range of conscious experiences are, are, can happen spiritually, but they're pure and decent. <laughs> yes? Oh. oh. Okay. So that's kind of what we did last time. And now we have a very interesting uh, verse, which is uh, 221, Tadartha Eva Drishya Syatma, which means, as I, I translated it literally, existing in brackets, which is implied. For the sake of the seer alone is the soul of the visible. Uh, I will explain what that means. First of all, this uh, verse is highly teleological, which is important. I was going to explain that. I just, I was showing off by saying the word not explaining it, but now I'm going to explain it. So the Greek word... The Greek word telos means a purpose or goal or objective. So teleology is the understanding that the world has a built-in purpose. In other words, the universe, there's a purpose. The, The world exists for a purpose. We don't simply create purposes. In other words, one view, like say a typical mid-20th century existentialist agnostic or atheistic view would be that, you know, the universe is just a bunch of dead matter. Don't pray to anything. No one hears you. 
There's no purpose in life. You have to create your own purpose. Just create your own purpose and go for it, but don't expect there to be a purpose in the world itself, in the universe. But teleology says no. The world has a purpose. And that's what, because it's created. I mean, obviously, teleologists, people that, that have this view of teleology, tend to be theists. They tend to believe the world is created by God. And therefore, obviously, if some you know, very intelligent, glorious creature does something, probably does it for a reason. And so the world is created with a purpose, namely the purpose of self-realization, the purpose of coming to perfect understanding, perfect knowledge, and then graduating from the material world and going to the spiritual world. So that it would be a teleological view of the universe. And atheistic philosophers, especially in the last hundred years or so, very much attack teleology. They can't stand it, the idea of teleology, because they're atheists. So atheists uh, don't like teleology, and, which is why probably a lot of people don't like atheists. I'm, I'm gonna, this verse is short. I'll put it up. I'll put the whole verse so you can see. Tararta. Tat means that, and, and artha means purpose. Here, tut, that stands for that seer, the seer. For the purpose of the seer. For the, in other words, for the sake. Also, that's how you say in Sanskrit, for the sake of the seer. Eva, which means only. Only for the sake of the seer. Only for the good of the seer. For the, and so on. For the purpose of the seer, it, existing in that way, is drishyasya, which means... Uh, Well, here, Atma is soul. So the soul of the physical thing, the soul of seeable things, the soul of physical external things, in other words, their essence, is the way of saying the essence of it, is only to exist for the purpose of a seer. I'll, I'll explain what that means. Basically, this is, not, this is a teleological view, also a phenomenological view. I'll explain what that is also. That's a... At no extra cost, you're getting a little <laughs> philosophy. Now, in philosophy, in, in serious philosophy, the word phenomenon, it's not just like, did you see, did you see that tennis match? That guy's a phenomenon. But, but, but in serious philosophy, phenomenon means something you can see a, 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 or a perceptible object. For example, in that sense, a, an electron is not a phenomenon because you can't see it. But the wall or, or bodies, things that you can experience in the world are tangible or phenomenal. And so phenomenal, phenomenology is a philosophy, which I think uh, makes a lot of sense, which says that although, let's say, take the sky, the sky is blue, and from the point of view of, let's say, certain kinds of scientists, they're interested in, in the atomic or chemical composition of the atmosphere and you know, the optics of the sun being sun rays being refracted through the atmosphere and all that. But from the point of view of an artist, it's just a beautiful blue sky. So think of how the artist sees, sees the sky and think of, think of how, let's say, uh, an astronomer sees the atmosphere. So for the artist, the beautiful blue sky is what's really important. And that's what phenomenology is. Phenomenology says that what's really important about the world, the important or the important aspect of the world, is the world that we perceive, because the world is made to be perceived. For example, let's say you buy a watch. Now the watch has all these technical parts and you know it has all that stuff inside. But I know myself because I'm not so technically inclined. When I buy a watch. I just want a watch that works. I don't really want to know about all the stuff inside. Mm -hmm. Or if I get a car, I just want it to run nicely. You know, it's like, don't tell me what's under the hood. And so, in a sense, that's the... Some people want to go under the hood of the universe. You know, they want to get it right under the hood and see all the little gears and everything. <laughs> but ultimately, if you take the teleological perspective, that, which means we're not against science... But if the essential truth is that God created the world, if that's the essential truth, that means that the world as we perceive it, the blue skies, you know, the birds and, and the trees and, and the rivers and all that, that's the world that we're meant to experience. 
And it's not that God is anti-science. I mean, you can do science if you want and maybe improve life through, I don't know, communications or medical research or whatever. But in terms of reality, there's a sense in which the world, as you see it, with the blue sky and the sun and your own body and so on, that's the, that, that, that is the real world. It's, it's not something behind that which is, you know, all the gears and the electrons and all that. Because we are meant to exist in the world for self-realization, which means to experience things in a macro way and then gradually transcend them. Are you following? I'm trying to explain. So that's, that's the relationship between teleology and phenomenology. If the world has a purpose, and the purpose is for us to realize God's purpose and go back to God, then sort of the macro world, with the colors and shapes that we can see, that's the world we're supposed to experience according to God's plan and learn from, basically. Although you can also do science if you want, but it's not that if you do science... You somehow you have a, a more realistic view of the sky because you talk about chemicals and stuff like that. that that's the idea. And so what, what Patanjali is saying is something like that. He's saying that the essence, the solar essence of the drishya, of the visible world, the essence of it is that it only exists for the purpose of the seer. In other words, the whole world was created to help us, who are conscious beings, to help us do something. The world exists for us. Which doesn't mean we should exploit it. It doesn't mean we should exploit the world, but it, it means that someone has made the world available to us for, for a good purpose. And that's what Patanjali is saying. That the essence of the visible world is that it, only, it exists only for the purpose of conscious, people, of conscious beings. And of course, the purpose will be enlightenment. The purpose is ultimately enlightenment. It's not for the individual, the way the individual sees the world. It's just the world itself. This earth it is... Oh, yeah, it's for, the, it's for the sake of each individual. But each individual's vision or perception of the world? Well, in the sense that, okay, for example, here you are, you're an individual soul. And you are a drusher, you're a seer, you're a conscious being. And so the world is here for you to facilitate your enlightenment, ultimately. And also, you know, either you can get orange juice and pancakes and other things you need and breathe the air. And... But, but ultimately, this world is created for you to facilitate your enlightenment. That's why there's a world at all. That's why there's a world at all to help you to ultimately achieve enlightenment and liberation. That's why the world is created. Patanjali makes it, yeah, then he says in 2.22, Kritartam prati nashtam apya nashtam taranya sa dharna twat. Any questions on that? Okay, what that means is, here Patanjali uses a common term which you also find in you, you, it's a very common term in Sanskrit, kritartham, which is the, uh, the same word artha, by the way. Krita, this is the verb, kri, to do, from which we get English words like create or increase. And then krita means done, to do and then done. And again, the word artha, same word, purpose. And so kritartha, is a very common phrase in Sanskrit which literally means, or, or it means a person whose purpose is fulfilled. A, per, a person whose purpose is fulfilled. A person that did what they needed to do. So in this case, because we're talking about yoga, if someone has actually fulfilled their purpose, which is enlightenment, which is to come to higher understanding. If someone has fulfilled that purpose, then that person is called kritartam. And so what potentially says is kritartam prati, which means in regard to the kritartam, in regard to that person, concerning that person. Kritartam prati. The, the visible world, the external world, is nashtam, which literally means lost or destroyed. And what he means here is, I, I tried to make that 
intelligible by my little brackets there, my <laughs> ubiquitous brackets, brackets, it lost its value, sort of the idea. In other words, it, it just, it's kind of like vanquished in the sense that the visible world no longer has much value for that person because, because the, the Kritartha person is seeing or has come to understand God and the soul is what's really important. And therefore, in other words, a successful, you wouldn't see a successful yogi like, let's say, you know, really lusting after a sports car or, or lusting after anything, really. Because the successful yogi has understood well, what's really important is God and the soul. And the external things are useful and, and divine in their own way because they're made by God, but that's not really where it's at. So that's the first statement. He says that Kritartam Prati, in regard to a Kritartha person, this world is Nashtam. And that, but even though it's, Api means even though, even though it's Nashta, it's lost its value, it is Anashta. It hasn't lost its value because Tadanya, there are other people besides the Kritartha person, there are other people in the world, Sadhana Twat. And because those other people are sort of, sadharna means sort of common, ordinary. And sadharna means because they sort of have an ordinary view of things. And this gets into an important principle that, which you also find in the Bhagavad Gita in chapter 3, that people who become spiritually advanced shouldn't, uh, what's the right word? shouldn't kind of like become proud and lord it over people that aren't enlightened and or encourage unenlightened people to do things that are very impractical for unenlightened people like an enlightened person may be able to give up anything or tolerate anything but if you're not enlightened you can't do that and so the idea here is that the enlightened person should remember that, almost every, that most people in the world aren't enlightened and for them the world is very important and just remember that. It's like Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita that, um, that even someone who has become spiritually perfect should still do their regular duties like, you know, like, like Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Or you know, pay your taxes, stop at red lights. You could say, you know, I'm enlightened. For me there's no red light or green light. <laughs> And also you can, you can mislead other people. Another, another point Krishna makes, I think Krishna really explains this in the Gita, he says that people, even if they're spiritually advanced, should not mislead ordinary people. Set a good example, do your duty, be a good citizen, and because otherwise, don't, remember, don't show off, don't flaunt your enlightenment. Just be a, a good citizen. Because for people in general, this world is still very important. And, and they'll become confused if you start showing off your transcendence. Then, Patanjali says, Swaswami Shakyo Sarupo Palabdi Hetu Sang Yoga. Often you can translate Sanskrit by starting to write, I mean, by starting at the end of the sentence and going backwards, and somehow it comes out English syntax. So I don't know which culture is backwards, but... Anyway, so, so if we start at the right, if you start at the end of the Sanskrit sentence, sun yoga. And again, here, the word yoga means a link or connection, but it means so many other things that in Sanskrit, when they want to make clear that we're using it in this sense of connecting, linking, and they want to really start, they say sun yoga, because sun means together, like linking together, connecting so sung yoga is just to make clear that you're using the word in specifically in the sense of connecting things. And here, of course, in this context, the word sung yoga refers to identifying the seer, the soul, and the body, which is the visible. And you shouldn't identify those two things. They're different things, the body and the soul. So therefore, starting at the right side, Patanjali says this sung yoga, this connecting or identifying two things that are really different, he to is the cause of upalabdi, the perception of swarupa, there being one nature, one nature 
in two things, which are shaktyo, in two energies, which are swa and swami. Oh, okay. So I'll explain that. It's really, Patanjali, really, in many different ways, is keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. In many different ways, you are not your body. You are an eternal soul. And he keeps saying it in so many different ways to try to get through to us. So here, he, remember I told you the word swa, it means one's own. And then swami, we already did the swa swami thing. Well here, Patanjali actually uses these two words. And he, in contrast, and he says that the, uh, he, he says, he calls them both energies, shaktis. And this is just the uh, dual genitive form, as you all probably suspected, strongly suspected. So, Swami, yes. So Patanjali is actually contrasting these two things. Now again, it's just like we talked about the visible things, let's say the, the seeable things, and the seer. So here's another way of saying the same thing. Swa means that which is possessed. Swami is the possessor. So we possess a body. So swa here, again, can mean the body or any of you know, you know, your properties, your house, your car, your, I don't know, your pet goldfish. So here swa, swa means that which you possess. And swami, the possessor. Again, body and soul. From so many different angles, he's saying the same thing. And he says both of these are shaktis. So of these two shaktis. The reason he calls the person a shakti, because he's calling both the, the, the property and the possessor, he's calling them both shaktis. And the reason for that is because in this understanding of life, this worldview, God is the shaktiman, the, the source of energy. God is the energetic. And so we are the creation of God. And matter, dead matter, is the creation of God, but they're different creations. One is living, one is dead. One is conscious, one is not. Like, for example, this marker pen. I mean, there's, there's no movement in America, you know, for marker pen rights. In the sense that it's not a person. It's, it's, bless you, it's, not, it's, not, it's not conscious, it's not alive, so it's just, it's, you know, it's just a dead thing. It's a marker pen. Whereas I'm a person, you're a person. So, but both of us are creations of God. I mean, the marker pen is, is ultimately God's creation. And we are God's creation, so therefore we're both shaktis, or energies that are created by an energetic source. So, potentially it says, if you identify that both of these have the same swarupa, same nature, this is the word swa and one's, uh, one's own in form. So, anyway, it sort of means like the intrinsic form of something, because swa in that sense means intrinsic. So, in other words, if you think that the possessor the person and the possessed are the same. I mean, some people have that problem. They think, like in Southern California, Southern California, you, know, you are what you drive, or you are not only LA. And it's, you know, it would be so nice if that was the only place in America that there was materialism. You know, for example, you are your neighborhood, especially in big cities. Like, you know, what neighborhood you live in, and what kind of car are you drive, and what kind of clothes you wear. And so if you think about it, this is what Patanjali is talking about. Confusing the possessor and the possessed. <clears throat> so you start to identify with your possessions, which is a very popular pastime in this country. Identify with your possessions. So this is very relevant today. This is what Patanjali is talking about. He's saying don't do that. So Patanjali says that this sang yoga, this false identification, is the cause of perceiving that the possessor and the possessed are the same. So I am my possessions. You know, everyone knows there are cases where people suddenly lose their fortunes and kill themselves because they were so identified with their possessions. So that, that's what he's talking about here. And then see if I can get through this quickly. Tasya hetur vidya. The cause of this, tasya means of this, hetur, the cause. The cause of this, this false identification, is ignorance. The cause is ignorance. And ignorance was specifically defined, that's why I brought this sheep, at um, 2.5.yogasutras.org. 
<laughs> so at <laughs> at two five two dot five, you have you got that, Jennifer? You haven't got it. Two five. Two. No, two five. Two five. You haven't got that. I'll, I'll read it for you because only I have it. This is a control mechanism. Only I have it. Yeah, uh, Patanjali said that ignorance is anitya suji dukkha natma su nitya suji sukatma kya Ignorance is to regard the non permanent as permanent. Yeah, we did. Yeah, the imp- so again, it's all saying the same thing the seer and the seeing, the permanent, the non permanent. The possessor, the possessed. It's just, they're, it's all synonymous. It's all getting to one simple point. You are an eternal soul. You're not a temporary body. So ignorance is to regard the non-permanent as permanent, the impure as pure, unhappiness as happiness, and the non-self as self. That's ignorance. So it's a very tight presentation potentially he's making because here he says, the cause of misidentifying the possessor and the possessed is ignorance, which is precisely this confusion of, of not understanding that there's a body and there's a soul. There's a spiritual world and a material world. So then he says, Tadavavatsam yoga bhavo hanam tadrashe kaivalya. When that ignorance does not exist, the misidentification does not exist. If you get rid of ignorance, you're no longer going to identify or confuse these things. Letting go of that way of seeing is liberation. Liberation is to let go of or to give up that way of seeing things where you misidentify your body and soul. You you think they're the same thing. And So once you come to that point, you will no longer say mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all. So that is Kaivalyam. And uh, Kaivalyam... Kevala means sort of like it means sort of like oneness, but in this case it means seeing everything as God in the sense that there's God and there's God's creation, so it's all the same corporation. You know, it's all the same thing. It's God and his creation. It's like sun and sunshine. There's a oneness. Even though the sun is a globe, it's a specific place in the sky, the sunshine is diffused everywhere. So clearly you can if you if you study astronomy, they distinguish different parts of the sun, you know, the sun's surface, the core the sun shines and all that stuff. But still, it's sort of one thing. It's just the sun shining. So we are like the sun shine, and God is like the sun. That's the conception. So that's the chi value. That's the oneness. It's not a oneness without distinction. It's not just a pure monism because Patanjali says the perfection of samadhi is devotion to God. So if I was God, why would I have to be devoted to God? There's a separate God that I'm supposed to be devoted to. So this word kaivalya, oneness, is not an absolute monism, which would be an obvious misinterpretation. And also the word kaivalya comes to mean in spiritual Sanskrit, just liberation. And so it's not, it's not endorsing strict monism. And then viveka kyatya viplava hanopaya, the way to let go, the way to let go, literally, is undeviating awareness of the distinction between seer and seen. So always keep that in mind that I'm, I'm a spiritual being. I'm not merely my body. It should probably save you a lot of money on clothes if you understand this. <laughs> so Patanjali says that's the way to let go. And then he says in his last verse for today, Tasya Saptadha Pranta Bhumi Pragya. The final stage of that process is the sevenfold wisdom. Uh, the unfortunate news here is that, according to scholars, it's not clear exactly what the sevenfold, what the seven stages are, but that doesn't stop all kinds of commentators from giving you seven, but it's not clear. In India, if you know India, and, and they had this real love for classification, which you also find in modern science, really. Yeah, there's love for classification, so there's innumerable lists, like the five this, the three that, the seven that, the eight that. There's just innumerable lists of things, and they, you know, they have all these little groups, sets of things, and so there's a group of seven 
there's a sevenfold pragya, there's a sevenfold wisdom. And but but anyway, the basic point here is that uh, the prantabhumi or the final stage is wisdom. In other words, you not only give up ignorance, but you actually achieve real positive wisdom. So he ends that discussion on a positive note. It's not just the absence of ignorance, but it's the presence of, of positive knowledge. So, I actually finished another on-time arrival.